This is part two of our lecture series on oceans. In this lecture, we're gonna cover the primary production in the ocean. So how is food sort of generated in our ocean food web? Primary production is hugely important um, to our global ecosystem because that is um, how we're pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, and that is also how we are forming the base of all of our food chains or most of our food chains. So about 50% of the Earth's primary production, that conversion of CO2 into sugars that form biomass that can then be eaten by other organisms is gonna happen in the ocean. Much of that primary production is done by phytoplankton. And it's a really diverse group of organisms. Um, so phyto means plant, plankton means to wander. So these are just wandering um, photosynthetic organisms in the ocean, but there's a diverse um, amount of them. They're, many different types of algae that are all unrelated to each other. There's cyanobacteria, and then there's even some um, land plants that have moved back into the ocean. So those phytoplankton are gonna make up the base of the marine food web. And a lot of it is actually gonna be cyanobacteria. So we can see this really cool graphic uh, where we have uh, primary production happening on the Earth's surface. And so areas where it is purple, that's where you have really low phytoplankton and areas where it's yellow, you have really high phytoplankton. And so we're seeing this change happen throughout um, the course of a year, right? So you have different seasons and as the earth tilts this way, we have our North Pole tilting away from the sun and the ice sheets move downward. And then as it towards, tilts back toward the sun, um, you have the ice sheets receding and um, that is really gonna fuel a lot of the changes in the ocean's primary productivity. You can see as those ice sheets melt, you get this um, kind of surge in primary production up in the North Pole. And then as those ice sheets form, that primary production gets pushed more toward the equator. You also have these really distinct and interesting zones here and here, which totally correspond with the areas of desert on land. Right, and so we know those deserts form because those are areas where we have that cool, dry, descending air. So that influences the um, photosynthesizers in the ocean just like it influences the photosynthesizers on land. So that air that's coming down um, is desiccating. It's um, not really conducive to growth. Um, and so we have a lot of our rain falling in these bands and rain can um, bring deposition of nutrients as well. Um, and it's, it tends to be warmer in those bands. So that's where we get more of our phytoplankton. Interesting how it mirrors the terrestrial surface. So here's that diagram of our Hadley cells um, and our polar cells where we have our descending cool dry air. And that creates those um, strips of desert both across the ocean and across our terrestrial surface. So in this um, graph, not really a graph, this image, um, we can see primary production both in the ocean and on terrestrial surfaces. And so purple is really low. And as you move toward um, yellows, oranges, and reds, that's getting really high. So our terrestrial surfaces are still doing most of that concentrated primary production, right? A, a rainforest is gonna do more primary production than some unit area of ocean, no matter what. Here's a really productive area, but it's still not even coming close to what we would see in a rainforest. So that 50% figure for the ocean seems kind of huge, right? But then you have to think, oh yeah, the ocean is huge. So that's why so much primary production happens in the ocean because it's just a vast expanse of space. So much like plants, um, phytoplankton, these photosynthi photosynthesizing organisms that are in the ocean are gonna require nutrients and they require a lot of the same nutrients that plants do. So nitrogen, phosphorus, um, and then interestingly, iron and silica are things that are um, kind of limiting in their environment. So our phytoplankton are floating on the top and that's where the sunlight is. Um, so they need to be up in that surface area, the euphotic zone, in order to photosynthesize and make food. However, the nutrients that are getting deposited into the ocean or added in some way 
are either rapidly absorbed or they sink to the bottom. And when our phytoplankton die, they also sink to the bottom. But the phytoplankton that are alive have to stay on the top. But all the food and nutrients and things that they need, they don't need food because they can photosynthesize, but all the nutrients and things that they need to build their tissues are falling down to the bottom of the ocean. So how are they going to get that back? Because there's these stratified layers in the ocean where it's cold and salty down here, and there's this distinct pycnocline, and then it's warm and not as salty up here. How does that nutrients get back up to the top? So in this graph, you can see phosphate is in blue, and then silica is in green. And so our phosphate concentrations are really low in the upper layer, so our euphotic zone. And then this is our pycnocline here, where we get a lot of drastic changes. And so our phosphate concentrations are low at the surface, and then they rapidly rise in the pycnocline and then stay pretty consistent. So we have a good amount of phosphate in our lower layers of the ocean because it's not being used up by photosynthesizers who need it. Um, so that just sort of stays stable as it sinks to the bottom. Same thing happens with our silica. And then we can see sort of the reverse happening with our oxygen concentration as well as our pH. So our oxygen concentration is the red line here, right? Yeah. So oxygen starts off really high and then drastically drops down and the pycnocline gets really low and then kind of rebounds as it goes down. So photosynthesizers, our phytoplankton, are gonna be producing oxygen. So lots of oxygen is produced here, high amounts of oxygen. What we're gonna be using up is CO2. So as these photosynthesizers die, right? as we saw when we talked about eutrophication, dead. So those are sinking, and then they get eaten by other organisms that are going to use up that oxygen, right, and produce CO2, like us. So in this zone, in the pycnocline, we have our photosynthesizing organisms getting eaten by other organisms, using up all that oxygen they produced, and that's why we get that really steep drop in oxygen very low oxygen in the pycnocline. Our pH starts off high, so that means it's really basic. And then our photosynthesizers are using up all the CO2, right? So CO2 plus water makes carbonic acid, so this makes a weak acid. So in these top layers of the ocean where we're using up all that CO2 to do photosynthesis, it's not acidic, it's very basic. And then as we switch to photosynthesis being our kind of primary thing that's happening to cellular respiration, that's being our primary thing that's happening, we start producing a lot of CO2, our oxygen is used up, um, and so we make a lot of CO2 and we get a lot of carbonic acid and our pH drops. So another huge change that happens in the pycnocline. We get changes in the amount of nutrients, the temperature, the salinity, the density, um, and our pH. So we have this really intense barrier, the pycnocline, between where our photosynthetic organisms are up in the euphotic zone and where all of our nutrients are that those photosynthesizers need. How are they going to get it? There's no natural diffusion process where those things would go back upward because of the pycnocline. So how do they get